Hello, everyone. Uh, we're very happy uh, that you're able to join us uh, for this webinar now. I see uh, participants are joining us uh, in drives as uh, they join. Um, uh, welcome uh, very much as you join us. Uh, we're waiting for more participants uh, so that we can uh, officially uh, begin. I'm hosting from Nairobi and I'm joined by Dr. Richard Thomas, who is in Cambridge uh, in the UK. And um, it's a fine afternoon here as we, as we try to do this webinar uh, during these hard times. Um, my name is uh, Kiondo Wawero. I'm the project manager uh, for the East African coverage of Conservation and Wildlife Journalism Project at the Internews Earth Journalism uh, Network. Um, Earth Journalism Network uh, is a community of 12,000 members in over 180 countries that is committed to improving and increasing uh, the quality and coverage of wildlife and conservation issues um, around the globe. Uh, for more information on this, uh, you can visit our website at earthjournalism.net. And this is our first webinar uh, for the East African project uh, that uh, we'll be hoping to be joined by uh, you uh, media uh, friends uh, from Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, and even South uh, Sudan. Uh, but uh, uh, for the EJN Global, uh, which is part, a project of internews, we've had other webinars that you can actually access uh, on our website uh, that I have uh, just shared, which is earthjournalism.net. Uh, um, as uh, we wait for more people, I see um, uh, more participants are joining us now. Uh, probably I could introduce our uh, speaker. Uh, for today, uh, who is um, uh, head of communications at Traffic? Uh, Traffic is the wildlife trade monitoring uh, network, and I believe uh, Dr. Thomas will be telling more uh, about himself. He's worked in the conservation for more than 20 years, so good people, we we in good hearts at Traffic. But he started his conservation career at uh, the Bad Life where he has he spearheaded the, the, influ, the avian flu uh, influenza outbreak communication in 2006 and 2007. And today, uh, he's the main spokesperson for traffic on the SARS-CoV-2, which is, I believe, is the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 uh, outbreak. Um, SARS-2 is the virus that causes the COVID-19 uh, disease. And soon, uh, we'll be having Dr. Thomas uh, take us through a presentation on today's webinar, uh, which uh, is the role of wildlife trade and the risk of the spread of uh, zoonotic diseases uh, to humans. Uh, so we'll have a few um, house rules uh, that you're hoping to look at as you join in, uh, you're on mute. So you're not able to ask questions uh, on, on voice, uh, but uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see a few icons or features. There is a Q&A feature. Uh, we do hope that you are able to, to type in there all your questions. Uh, please um, don't use the chat feature. Again, use the Q&A uh, for the questions that you have and kindly try to to keep them uh, short and concise and as relevant to the topic of discussion today as uh, possible. Uh, so I think at, at this moment, uh, before I welcome uh, Dr. Thomas, I would like to welcome you again uh, during these uh, hard and unique times. And we hope that you are well and safe. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. And uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Thomas now uh, to introduce himself. And as we share the ground rules one more time, and then we'll go ahead to his presentation. Uh, Dr. Thomas will present for about 20 uh, minutes, thereabouts, I hope, uh, Dr. Thomas. 
And then after that, we'll open up to Q&A and my colleagues will help me uh, to select the questions and we'll hope to answer as many of them as we can. And uh, kindly also note that we are recording this webinar and it will be available immediately after uh, this conversation on our website at earthjournalism.net. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas, and uh, for having time, taking time uh, during these difficult times to join us. And we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Um, the floor is yours for now. Thank you very much, Kayindu, for your very kind introduction. I hope everybody can uh, hear me and see me. Uh, as Kayindu mentioned, I'm going to give a short uh, presentation. Uh, and then after that, there'll be plenty of time for uh, some questions. And I hope to uh, answer as many of those as I can do. Um, so let's, uh, let's start straight away with the presentation then. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, I hope you can all uh, see the first slide here. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Dr. Richard Thomas. I'm uh, Head of Communications at Traffic. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19 and its relationship with uh, wildlife trade. Uh, first of all, though, I must uh, say that this is um, uh, first and foremost a public health crisis. Uh, and we mustn't forget that. And obviously our sympathy goes out to, to everyone who's been affected, people who've lost loved ones, uh, and the enormous impact it's having on, it, on our everyday lives and on the economy and people who've lost jobs and income. Uh, so we must, mustn't forget that. But obviously with it having um, uh, presumed roots in wildlife trade, we, we, uh, it's very much uh, associated with the work that we carry out. Uh, a couple of bits of terminology I'd just like to clarify right at the outset. Uh, the virus that's causing uh, the disease is called SARS-CoV-2 uh, and when it infects people uh, the disease that it causes is known as COVID-19. Quite often you'll see that uh, misreported or misinterpreted in the media. Okay, I'm going to, um, this is sort of an outline of the talk I'm going to give today. I'm going to give you a, a very brief introduction about traffic, uh, as I've got uh, you all here at the moment, in case you don't know about our organisation. I'm going to give a, a, a very quick overview of wildlife trade in general. And then I'm, we're going to move and look into the, uh, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and look at its possible origins. Uh, and then look at a lot of the gaps in knowledge about what we don't know about that process and what uh, we don't know about uh, how it may, uh, how it propagates and so on. And then we'll look at what policy implications there are for wildlife trade. And then after the presentation, uh, I'd like to invite you to ask questions, which I shall do my best to, to answer. Okay, uh, a little bit about traffic. Our mission statement is that uh, we work to ensure that trade in wild plants and animals is not a threat to the conservation of nature. Um, so we're very much uh, monitors of wildlife trade to try and understand the dynamics of it. Uh, and we're an international non-governmental organization. We were founded in 1976 by IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and WWF, the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, so we spent more than 40 years working on wildlife trade. We're uh, an independent NGO now, and we're essentially um, founded to help governments with implementation of the uh, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES, which had uh, recently come into uh, operation. Uh, we have around 150 global members of staff uh, situated worldwide. The majority of staff are, are actually based in uh, Asia and Africa. Uh, the headquarters office is in the United Kingdom. Uh, and we have offices on five continents. Uh, and we have a policy of making all our information about wildlife trade uh, open and freely accessible. So if there's a particular area that, that interests you, I'd, I'd strongly encourage you to drop by our website, www.traffic.org, uh, where you can find a huge library of PDFs around a whole variety of topics related to wildlife. 
Um, just a reminder that there's essentially two sides to wildlife trade, and this is how we, we uh, work in traffic. We work on uh, trying to prevent illegal trade and poaching, uh, which are clear threats to conservation, sustainable development, and even national security. Well, we also try and promote legal wildlife trade that can offer essential revenue and development opportunities for communities, uh, for countries and local communities. Uh, we call them our green work stream and our wide red work stream. Uh, wildlife trade in general. Now, uh, wildlife is uh, a commodity just like any other commodity that's uh, traded internationally. Uh, and the main markets are East Asia, North America and the, the European Union. Um, there's quite often a lot of confusion you, you read in the media about the term uh, markets. What's, what's a wildlife market? And you probably have heard the term wet market. Uh, a wildlife market is essentially uh, something like this illustration on the right of the, uh, the screen here, uh, somewhere that only sells uh, wildlife. Uh, and it's the dominant uh, thing that's in commerce there. Whereas you'll have heard the term wet markets. Uh, and that is actually a much more general term. And wet markets actually refer to markets uh, that sell fresh produce. So it can be anything from groceries, uh, you know, fruit, fruit and vegetables. Uh, and within some of these wet markets in Asia, there may be stalls that sell uh, wildlife, um, but the, the terms aren't interchangeable, uh, although you frequently see them confused in uh, media reports in particular. Okay, a very quick uh, overview of uh, wildlife trade. When you mention it to, to most people, they tend to think of the, the trade in uh, animals. Uh, and certainly animals are traded for, for medicine, for food, uh, some, some as pets and for their products such as uh, skins, reptile skins. Uh, but actually in terms of overall wildlife trade globally, it's, it's quite a small percentage uh, that's animal trade. It's something like 3% in terms of value. Uh, more than double that are, are non-wood forest products, uh, things like fungi. There's also trade in food plants, ornamental plants. Uh, and a big global trade in medicinal and aromatic plants. But the biggest wildlife commodities actually in trade are, are fisheries, which is something like a quarter of all uh, wildlife species that are traded and obviously very, very important for um, uh, food and nutrition for billions of people worldwide. And forestry products, so timber is actually the biggest uh, commodity in terms of uh, value and volume by some distance. Okay, that's a very quick overview of traffic and wildlife trade in general. Uh, I'm now going to move on to what's the, the, the main topic of today's uh, uh, discussion, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, I'm going to first look at its geographic origins and what we actually uh, know uh, about where it came from. Uh, and I'm sure you've all heard of this uh, seafood market in Wuhan. Uh, the Huanan Seafood Market, which is said to be the epicenter of the epidemic. Um, but actually, when you start to look into the uh, evidence behind that, it's far from clear that this market is where the uh, virus actually originated. The, the key paper, which is on your screen there, the reference to it, is, is published in The Lancet, which is a medical journal, uh, and it's published in February this year. And it examines the, the case histories of the first 41 patients who were admitted to hospital uh, suffering from COVID-19. Uh, and of them, uh, two thirds, some 27 of them, uh, actually uh, had direct contact with the Huanan seafood market. So uh, the link there does look um, a little bit shaky, but if you look a bit further into the information uh, that's published in that paper, the very first patient uh, who presented on the 1st of December uh, had no known connection to the market. Uh, and the next, uh, sec or the second to fourth patient uh, didn't um, present until the 10th of December. So there's a nine day gap there. And of those next three patients, only one of them had a, a direct link to the Huanan seafood market. So uh, I'm sure we'll find out further down the line once virologists have done a, a lot more testing and sequencing uh, of the virus. 
we may get some further insights into into where it originated but i think the the jury is still very much out on on whether it was indeed the uh, wuhan seafood market is, is widely reported moving on to the animal origins um, well what do we know about coronaviruses well one of the um, key bits of knowledge uh, that we do have is that bats are the uh, natural animal reservoirs for coronaviruses that uh, within bat populations uh, coronaviruses uh, are circulating uh, bats coronaviruses were considered the origin of the uh, SARS outbreak, the severe acute respiratory syndrome outbreak in 2002-2003, you may recall, and of the Middle East respiratory syndrome, the MERS outbreak in 2013. Uh, but I'd really like to draw your attention to a paper that was published in Viruses, uh, Journal Viruses, in March of 2019. So this is some months ahead of the uh, um, SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. And in it, the authors state that uh, it is highly likely that future SARS or MERS-like coronavirus outbreaks will originate from bats. And there is an increased probability that this will occur in China. Uh, now, the reasoning for that is partly that um, uh, coronaviruses appear to be particularly uh, prominent in bat populations within China. Uh, although they are found worldwide, so uh, you know coronaviruses are known in bats in, in North America, for example. Um, but I do think that the, their words um, were quite extraordinary, considering how uh, events turned out just a few months later. So, what do we know about bats in trade? I apologise, there's rather a lot of text on this screen, but uh, I think there's a very, very important uh, statement that we're coming to. Uh, well, first of all, bats themselves are rarely seen, very rarely seen in trade in China. Uh, we do see some trade of fruit bats, mainly in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia in particular. Uh, but bats themselves uh, don't appear in markets, uh, or we have very little evidence uh, of that. However, there is a folk medicinal use for bats in China. And... Uh, there's a paper that was published in February this year that appears in Letters of, uh, in Applied Microbiology, uh, looking at the potential risks from coronaviruses in traditional uh, Chinese medicine. And I'm going to read out the statement at the bottom because I, I, I had to do it, read it two or three times before I quite believe what I'd uh, just read. But it states, the authors state, that the use of bats in TCM is of great concern and the use of the greater horseshoe bat is of particular interest. The feces of this bat, Yaming Sha in Chinese, marketed, marketed as Vespertilionosis, is used to cure eye conditions while body parts are dried and added to wine or ground into a powder for oral intake as a means to detoxify the body. Both practices could be highly risky in case an animal was infected with a coronavirus, particularly the first use as the, as the virus can be present in feces and can enter a host via the eye. So I think that's a, a very clear warning from the uh, authors of this paper uh, about the potential dangers of using uh, bat feces uh, in a medicinal manner. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier the SARS outbreak and the MERS outbreak. Uh, both of those, uh, the original virus was believed to have come from bats, but uh, in order to cross the species barrier from bats into people, uh, both were believed to go via another animal group. In the case of SARS, it was believed the coronavirus transferred from uh, bats to civets, and then from there made the jump to people. In the case of MERS, it was thought that the coronavirus jumped from bats to camels to people. Uh, and you may have seen, uh, there's been a great deal of speculation as to whether pangolins are the missing link in how coronavirus, uh, the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, obtained the ability to infect people, uh, whether it went from bats to pangolins to people. 
uh, and there was a paper published just a few months ahead of the uh, COVID-19 epidemic uh, in October 2019, again in the journal Viruses, uh, that found evidence of coronaviruses infections in uh, Malayan pangolins. Uh, and subsequently, in February of this year, uh, the South China Agricultural University uh, made a claim of a, a greater than 90% genetic overlap with human SARS-CoV-2 in pangolin populations. Now their uh, original claims haven't stood up to full scientific scrutiny. Nevertheless, there is quite a high degree of overlap between the coronaviruses found in uh, pangolins and that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 found in people. So the link with pangolins certainly remains possible, but it's far from proven at this stage. What do we know about uh, trade in pangolins? Well, uh, international trade has been heavily restricted for, for many years, uh, but in 2017 it was fully banned under the CITES. Now, the traffic has been studying the trade in pangolins, uh, and we found something like an average of, of 20 tons of pangolins and their parts are, are trafficked internationally every year. Uh, and it's somewhere around 900,000 animals have been traded over a 20 year period from 2000 onwards. Uh, most are trafficked uh, as scales, which are used in, uh, for medicinal use. Um, there's relatively few seizures that take place involving live pangolins, and that's partly because uh, the live animals are notoriously difficult to um, uh, keep alive in captivity. Uh, and we've no, found no evidence of live pangolins being trafficked from Africa to Asia, for example. All the cases involving live pangolins we've seen have been within Asia. Uh, some have been destined for China, some have been destined uh, for Vietnam, which is another big consumer. Um, and we hold information on 603 seizures uh, involving live pangolins between the period of 2004 and 2020, uh, approximately 15,000 uh, live animals. So, what are the impacts of uh, the outbreak uh, and its presumed or potential link to uh, wildlife trade? Uh, we've already seen the uh, China government uh, at the end of January uh, implement a temporary ban on uh, all trade in wild animals. Uh, there, there's currently discussion about um, uh, whether this will be made uh, permanent or not. There's, there's legislation that's currently uh, in progress uh, and will be uh, finalised and, and implemented further down the line, but it's, it's possible that ban may, may be made permanent. Uh, Vietnam has also introduced a, a temporary ban on, on wild animal trade. Uh, I think these temporary bans are probably a, a pretty prudent measure at this stage uh, until we know more about the virus and its origins. Uh, it's probably a good idea just to put a, a temporary halt on the, the, the trade um, until we can work out what measures uh, or what action should be taken. Uh, another immediate impact has been um, we've seen increased reports of poaching. Uh, the uh, image on the right here is taken from a WCS uh, report who, who uh, noted that um, some very rare birds called giant ibises had been deliberately poisoned uh, in northern Cambodia. Um, in, in many ways, this is um, not an unexpected uh, thing to have happened in that um, the economic impact of the, the outbreak has been that many people have lost uh, income and uh, possibly jobs and livelihoods and they're um, turning to uh, what they can uh, get as you know, natural resources nearby. So uh, while it's extremely concerning from a conservation perspective, I mean, the, the birds that were killed here, are th only three individuals, but probably something like 1% of the global population of that species. Uh, it's in many ways uh, a not unexpected um, impact of the, uh, um, the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, another impact we've seen are fear attacks that uh, 
people have uh, well I've seen one report from Peru for example where local people have uh, attacked a bat colony out of fear that uh, bats would be carrying coronaviruses of course um, that's not a, uh, a, a rational response I mean and bats are incredibly important to people you know they're in, vital as pollinators and for seed dispersal uh, there's an awful lot we can learn about bats they have a remarkable biology not least that they can um, host these uh, coronaviruses uh, but not get uh, sick from them uh, they're also very good at repairing their dna so there's an awful lot we can learn from bats and we should learn to live with them and not try and uh, fight against them uh, we've also seen reports from gabon uh, of a, a plummeting demand for pangolins in the uh, markets there that uh, the, the buyers for pangolin meat have, have disappeared. Um, how widespread or how long term that's going to be uh, remains to be seen. Um, there's another area that we're, we're keeping a close eye on which is how um, the demand for certain medicinal plants uh, that are used in treatments uh, for COVID-19 um, might be affected. <clears throat> this was um, something that happened post SARS that particular uh, medicinal plants many of which are wild harvested were suddenly in, in very high demand um, and their populations they were, they were basically over harvested and their populations suffered. Um, you can find a, a lot more uh, detail about that on our, our website there's a paper there. Um, we've also seen in very widespread calls particularly from the NGO community for uh, bans, simple bans on all wildlife trade. Um, we don't believe that's uh, a realistic long-term solution uh, of traffic. I um, mean, there's far too many people worldwide rely on uh, wild sourced uh, animals uh, for a key form of sustenance. Um, and it's just not realistic just to stop all trade like that. Uh, and the other big issue is that uh, bans uh, will just tend to push trade underground so that uh, it would become black markets and therefore it becomes a lot more difficult uh, to monitor and regulate. And actually the traffic, we believe that disease uh, mitigation measures are needed so that uh, we need to identify the high risk species, the high risk uh, situations in which uh, these um, lethal diseases can be generated and cross the species barrier and we're actually got an open uh, invite to experts from a range of uh, disciplines outside of traffic's expertise so uh, expertise in particularly human medicine uh, and animal health um, you know getting their insights virologists epidemiologists and so on uh, and trying to formulate some clear guidelines as to which, uh, you know, which species uh, should not be kept together or in particular numbers, or there might be a whole range of uh, recommendations that come out of that. And then we would uh, encourage, encourage uh, governments worldwide to implement uh, these measures that were drawn up by uh, relevant experts. It may need some uh, legislative changes. Uh, so uh, if that was the case, we'd certainly encourage uh, governments to, to make uh, the necessary changes. Um, but ultimately, what, what drives trade in particular animals or plants or whatever is the demand uh, for those commodities. So there may be some element of consumer behaviour change interventions that are needed, um, so-called demand reduction. Um, again, this is an area where we have some uh, expertise uh, and fairly long-term um, studies going on. Um, and finally, uh, how, what about traceability in supply chains? So that uh, you occasionally hear of a, a particular commodity that's being sold in supermarkets is, is being contaminated. Is it realistic in the longer term to, to introduce traceability measures for, for any commodity that's being sold in markets so that you will know which batch has been contaminated so that they can be uh, taken off the shelves. So I think traceability is quite an uh, important issue as well. Um, that's all I wanted to uh, say uh, 
during this presentation, but if you would like uh, any further information on uh, this as any aspects uh, what I've just spoken about, I'd strongly encourage you to visit uh, our website, traffic.org. Uh, there you will find the briefing document. Uh, there's a, a screenshot of the front cover on the screen there. You can download that and that gives our perspective on COVID-19 and zoonotic disease risks. Uh, you'll also find uh, items on uh, the coronavirus pandemic and wildlife trade, what our perspective on it is. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have the uh, a study on the, the role of wild plants in health treatments uh, and the species that may well be uh, impacted from the virus. Uh, so, with, at that point, I'd like to stop there and invite questions. Uh, if, if there's any questions we don't have time to get to today, or uh, I haven't got the um, resources at hand to, to answer them, then uh, my email's on the screen there, richard.thomas.traffic.org, and I'd be happy to try and follow up uh, with anything you may have. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, for your informative presentation. Uh, dear colleagues uh, who are joined for this traffic, if you are not there when uh, we're doing introductions, my name is Kiondo Wawero, a project manager for Earth Journalism uh, Network, a project of internews uh, here in East Africa. And we were joined uh, by our guest today, uh, Dr. Richard Thomas of Traffic, who's just presented. And now, Dr. Richard, we have uh, several questions that uh, I will read to you one by one. And I would like to remind our participants uh, kindly when you ask me your question, could you kindly tell us uh, where you are, uh, who you work, uh, and where you work, where you're writing from, and where you work? Uh, thank you very much. And I have one of uh, one question, Dr. Thomas. Uh, when you say that uh, in one of your slides uh, that uh, uh, the pangolin, pangolins, uh, there is still no ring uh, to a possible connection to coronaviruses. And there are several mm -hmm. studies uh, that are being done. Do you know of any study uh, that is close to, uh, to these, uh, to giving us the link, if uh, at all? Uh, this, the, the, the South China Agricultural University, they, they claimed a very strong uh, link to, to the pangolins virus to uh, SARS-CoV-2, but um, their initial claims, and I'm, I'm a bit uh, uh, fuzzy on the exact details, but, but basically it wasn't as big a, an overlap in the genetic code of the virus as they had originally claimed. It was only in one part of the virus that there was a, a the degree of overlap they'd stated. And so the scientific community has um, now looked at their results and said, okay, it's it's possible that it's the pangolin link, but it's, it's by no means uh, as, as clear as you, have you made out. Um, nevertheless, I think it, it, it was quite a finding that pangolins can host coronaviruses. Uh, that was a pretty new uh, finding. Uh, and it was, it was made just before um, the outbreak of COVID-19. Um, so clearly that, you know, people have been studying what viruses uh, can be studied, can be carried by different animal groups. Uh, and this was a bit of a surprise, I think. Um, but whether it will ever be proven that pangolins are uh, the missing link or whether it may turn out to be another uh, animal group, we, we don't know at this stage. But obviously, you know, there's, there's plenty of people now looking <laughs> and sifting through the evidence. And we, we hope to get a a firm answer one way or the other down the line. If indeed there is a, an intermediate group, I mean, it's, uh, again, virologists may be able to pin down whether it may be a direct bat to human transfer. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas, for that. Uh, if now I could read you some of the questions, uh, probably we can answer one, uh, one by one. I have sure. uh, one from Caroline Chebet, uh, writing from Kenya in Nakuru County. And uh, she's re referring to one of your reports titled Flying Under the Radar, uh, that Jomo Kenyatta International Airport was flagged as a hot spot where many seizures of pangolins were recorded. How is the current situation? Is Kenya still one of major transit route route on illegal wildlife trade? 
Uh, yeah, it was the report was a joint one with the C4 ads, uh, another study you're referring to. Um, and certainly, uh, Kenya, yes, it has certainly had, had a problem in the past as being a major exit point for, for illegal wildlife products uh, leaving the African continent. Uh, however, um, there have been uh, a number of moves, particularly at the seaports, uh, to try and uh, clamp down on people who are trafficking products through them. Uh, so we've seen the introduction of uh, trained sniffer dogs, for example, uh, which, which can help with checking seaport containers. Uh, and, the, and there is a, also a, a great deal more awareness now amongst uh, customs and uh, also airline staff uh, about how um, traffickers are using uh, airports and aircraft and so on to, to traffic products. Uh, and indeed, we have a, um, uh, a program called Roots, uh, which uh, traffics the lead on a, a partnership called the Roots Partnership, which is working with the aviation sector, uh, working at uh, airports with the security staff there, with the customs officers, and also with airline staff, so that they're trained to look out for uh, telltale signs that, that products are being um, smuggled uh, through those, those outlets. So. Uh, the aviation sector as a whole is very much stepping up to this uh, this issue. Okay, uh, I think we have so many questions related to that. And also from Kenya, we have Peter Moirori, who is asking that, are there protocols within traffic to ensure that the trade in wildlife species does not transfer dangerous viruses from such animals to humans? Uh, no, there isn't. And this is where we're but it's really outside our expertise. We don't have uh, animal health uh, experts on our staff. And this is where we're really keen to build partnerships, uh, not just on animal health, but also on human health, because it's, it's all, into, all into linked. So, um, you know, people like the, the World Animal Health um, Organization, OIE, uh, World Health Organization, you know, getting, getting all these experts together uh, and trying to formulate uh, and, and firm guidelines about how to manage wildlife trade so that the disease risk is minimized. Uh, it's a very important uh, lesson that we have to take from this whole uh, COVID-19 outbreak. Okay, thank you. I know you mentioned about the temporary ban of wildlife trade in China and Yang uh, Yi Neying, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, is asking how important is the role of Southeast Asian nations in combating uh, IWT? Uh, well, the Southeast Asia region is a, is a major one for uh, trafficking of, of wildlife. Um, you know, there's a lot of products that are trans uh, trafficked within that region and also to elsewhere beyond their borders. Uh, and but it is a global, it is a global issue. Um, it's, yes, Southeast Asia uh, does have a particular problem, but it's, it's by no means the only region that, that has uh, issues with this. And all governments need to, to step up. I mean, uh, well, obviously traffic's been saying for years that uh, illegal wildlife trade is a serious problem. Um, but I think uh, this, this latest outbreak has just brought home how potentially um, what the potential impacts are if, if things go as badly wrong as they have done. Okay, uh, DT Patil, from, uh, he's not saying where he's from. He's asked a question that I think you referred to in the presentation about has there been any demand reduction interventions in China? If that is where maximum demand is generated from. And you said that um, the demand is actually going down. Uh, uh, could you talk to that briefly? Um, yes, there, there are uh, have been some demand reduction measures in China, but uh, prior to this, it was it was focused on uh, ivory, um, to trying to persuade people to use other uh, alternatives to to ivory. Um, this is way way in advance of the the COVID nineteen outbreak. Um, uh, so, from that perspective, yes, the what we don't know uh, is what the long-term impact of the outbreak will be uh, on 
uh, demand for things like pangolins. Uh, I mean, what, one of the issues that we're, we're coming up against uh, is that, of course, all our, like everyone, all our staff are homebound at the moment. So we're very much relying on, on what we can glean from the internet uh, to try and understand what the, 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 um, the impacts of being on the ground because we can't get out and survey markets and so on. Um, but the, the indications are that there's been a, a short term drop in pangolin demand, whether that will be sustained remains to be seen. I suspect, given the severity uh, of, of this, that, that, that it may well be a long-term impact, but we shall see. Yeah, we do hope so. And there is actually another one question connected to that, which is interesting from uh, Clifford Akumu, who is a freelance environment journalist uh, from Kenya. Uh, he's saying fear attacks on wildlife believed to have transferred the virus to humans is likely to decimate the numbers. What can be done? Uh, well, it's, I think it's got to be education. I mean, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, you know, we need bats. <laughs> you know, bats yeah. are, are vital for the environment. Uh, and, and that it's, it's not bats that have uh, been spreading this virus. You know, it's, it, it's uh, possibly they, they, they were the, the origin, but you can't put the blame on them. <laughs> You know, we can learn a lot from their biology about how, how their bodies can cope with it. Um, so they should be our allies. Uh, and plus we need them for a healthy environment. So uh, I, I can understand the, the fear response uh, as being a, you know, a gut reaction, but it's not, a, it's not an appropriate response. So that's a, a question of um, trying to make sure that the, uh, you know, when when you're writing stories, it's, it's trying not to to evoke that response in people, that to un, for people to understand that bats are our friends. <laughs> we need to live with them. Yeah. I think that's a very good, important point. Uh, where how we write our stories uh, to make sure we don't uh, uh, we, we we don't you know take the conversation uh, further and uh, re re report, as you said, that bats are our friends. Unfortunately, the questions are jumping, and uh, yes, I've seen the one that I was looking for. And I, as I said earlier, we've had these webinars uh, with AGN Global, uh, several of them that you can actually find on our website, that is earthjournalism.net. And this, this question, uh, Dr. Thomas, keep recurring in all of these webinars. And this one is asking, this is Micah Roxas, he's not saying where he's from, but why do people still believe COVID was made in a lab? Uh, well, um, I'm not an expert virologist, but, uh, but uh, I, there is a paper that's been published uh, that according to virologists proves that it's not um, a, a laboratory uh, made virus it's not it's not a man-made one now, i don't i don't understand the science of it it's, it's it's outside of my area of expertise but i'm confident that if a peer-reviewed scientific paper is saying that no it cannot be from a lab that it will just be um the rumor rumor mill working uh claiming that it is uh i i trust in the scientists but i accept that they they have expertise in areas that i simply don't um, so I'm confident that's that's not where it originated. Okay. Uh, wow. Uh, I'm selecting questions and they keep uh, going away. I have Christian Vincent. Again, does it say where uh, he or she is from? And uh, the question is, since bats are carriers of coronavirus, but are not getting sick from it, can we further study the resistance of bats on how to find a possible cure or vaccine, uh, vaccine for the disease? I, I know you just said you're not a virologist, but what do you think about this? Um, well, well, absolutely. I think there's a lot we can learn from the biology of bats. Um, again, I've, I've, I've read um, that apparently they very rarely get cancer, for example, because they, their biochemistry is such that they can repair their DNA very, very efficiently and very rapidly. Uh, yeah. So they, they have a incredible tolerance to um, viruses um, that you know the fact that these coronaviruses can circulate without uh, negative impacts on bat populations so I'm sure there is a lot we can learn um, it's, it's not something that uh, it, that would be within traffic sphere um, but 
that there are sort of biologists and virologists and so on who, who I'm sure will be looking at that aspect. Um, I think the on the vaccine question, it, it's more a question of time that, uh, you know, the sooner we get a vaccine, the, the sooner we can get out of uh, this, this sort of bind that COVID-19 has got us into. Um, and I think they're just using the tried and trusted routes that they know will generate vaccines. But uh, even so, it may be months away before there is a human vaccine. Uh, the most optimistic uh, guesstimation I've heard is, is this September, but I, I think most experts are saying it will be about a year away before we get a, a vaccine. About a year, you said. And uh, yeah, dear participants, uh, some of the questions uh, are similar uh, to what we've have already been answered. Or Dr. Thomas probably hinted on them uh, during his presentation. So if you can look at uh, the Q and A feature, the answered questions that our colleagues are trying to just say this one have been answered. So probably it's good to refer to that uh, before uh, you know actually typing and. Uh, I also do hope, I want to repeat, uh, but there is one from uh, Abjata uh, Khalif, who is calling from Kenya, and he's asking, what's the role of the private sector in disrupting the IWT supply chain? Uh, sorry, what, what was the role of the... You, I, the private se sector, yeah, in disrupting uh, the trade of illegal wildlife trade. Uh, well, the private sector's got a major uh, role to play. So, um, at Traffic, we're working um, with a number of uh, areas within the private sector, the Korea companies, the aviation sector I mentioned, uh, we're in, uh, with the online community. Um, so, uh, Traffic I4 and WWF, we convened uh, all the major uh, internet companies um, in the global, the coalition against global wildlife trafficking. Um, and that includes all the big names, you know, Google and Facebook and, uh, and all these guys, as well as the big Chinese companies. Uh, so they're stepping up to the mark there. We're also engaging, um, as I mentioned, with the, the big courier, you know, DHL and, and all these sort of guys, because um, what we're increasingly seeing is wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade is going online where it's, you know, it's easy for buyers to get in touch with sellers uh, uh, anonymously. Um, or it's very difficult to monitor what's, what's going on. But then of course the, the product has to be transferred between the two. And that's where a, a third party courier company is likely to be, to be used. And so we're training staff there to be on the lookout for suspicious packages or uh, suspicious items. Uh, you know, there's certain giveaways about when they're being used to, to actually traffic uh, illegal wildlife parts. So uh, there's a lot to be done there. And, and the transport sector as well, as, as I mentioned, we're working with uh, the airlines and, and a bit with the shipping companies as well. So a, a big role to play. Yeah. Okay. And um, are the platforms for the online you know, trade are also known, the platforms that are being used for these illegal wildlife trade? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, social media, or closed social media groups in particular, they're, they're very hard to um, uh, penetrate and monitor. Um, but the, the, the online companies are, are pretty much stepping up to the, uh, the task. You know, they've made commitments um, about um, taking away, taking down uh, adverts for illegal wildlife products and, uh, you know, the, the information about who's uh, posting them, uh, they're, they're gathering that as well, and that can be transferred to the uh, enforcement agencies for follow-up. So um, there has been a very positive response, I would say, from the online sector. Okay, um, I think in your, uh, when we're doing the introduction, we mentioned that uh, you spearheaded the response of the H5 N1 uh, bird flu outbreak of 2006 and 2007 uh, for the traffic. And uh, I see Joy uh, from the Philippines of Digital Live Asia asking, what can we do to combat misinformation and conspiracy theories surrounding the origins of COVID-19? And I know we joined by our colleagues in the media. Uh, from your experience, how can we best tell this story? Well, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned um, the H5N1 bird flu uh, 
there because um, that there was basically a major misinformation campaign that was being perpetrated by the commercial poultry industry because um, the natural reservoir uh, for that virus was in wild bird populations in wildfowl, but it was actually uh, created and generated the, the virulent form uh, within the commercial poultry industry and it was being passed from commercial, commercial poultry operation to commercial poultry operation. But every single news report was, was saying it was wild birds that were, they were doing the transportation. Uh, and it was just nonsense. Um, when you actually looked into the science of it, uh, you could find connections between all the outbreaks, between where there were commercial poultry operations taking place. Now, I don't believe there's, there's anything quite as um, uh, cynical, I guess you could say, <laughs> taking place with COVID-19, trying to cover up uh, where or when it uh, came from. I, I think it is genuinely unknown. Uh, at this stage um, and I think but but what I would encourage is that uh, as journalists you you dig as deep as you can to try and find out uh, if there is a, uh, if there are any cover-ups going on um, but I would also encourage you know everybody to be absolutely open and transparent about what they do know um, because it's obviously in everybody's interest that that something like this never happens again uh, and to try and ensure that, we need to understand precisely what its origins were. Um, so that would be that would be my key message on that. Okay, and uh, related to this, and again, you mentioned that, uh, of course, there is the legal uh, trade of wildlife, and uh, there is uh, this uh, interesting question that I get uh, here from Rational Janal. Uh, Janal, he also doesn't say where he's from, and he says, uh, do you think after this pandemic, the wildlife, wildlife supply chain uh, for human consumption should be stopped straight away. Referring to the past, we haven't stopped consuming chicken even after the outbreak of bird flu several times in the past. <laughs> yeah, um, so in the long term, no, we don't, uh, Traffic doesn't believe it should just be, be stopped uh, like that. I don't, we don't think that's practical, but uh, the key thing is to mitigate against disease risk. So understanding the risks of any trade that's taking place, uh, and that's from whatever source, whether it's particular species or particular conditions, um, you know, keeping large numbers of animals in the same place, for example, that's, that appears to be a, a risky thing to do. Uh, and some species are obviously more, uh, potentially more risk, you know, have danger more associated with them uh, in the way that they're, they're traded and so on. Uh, and there needs to be a sort of long-term formulation about it that, that if, you, if you just simply ban it, it will go underground and your chance to, to really regulate it and monitor it is gone. Uh, but if, you, if the trade is uh, allowed to, to resume, um, then you have the option to uh, monitor and uh, regulate it to try and mitigate against disease risks. So there's a lot of measures that um, need, to be, need to be worked out and, and, and implemented. But it, it sort of also highlights why it's so important to, to understand what the origins were of the disease, uh, how, it, how it actually arose. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas. We almost at the top of the one hour that we had said we could take this webinar for. Uh, probably we can take one or two uh, more questions. And I'm glad that we have not only attracted uh, members of the further states, but we also have people from uh, you know, other sectors, NGOs, and also students. And I'm gonna mm -hmm. uh, read one question from a student uh, from the Philippines, uh, Angeli Buela, uh, who is asking, what can you suggest to the government especially in Southeast Asia, to combat IWT and how are you going to convince them with your statement? What are the ways that must be strictly implemented? What are the ways that must be uh, not very clear, but I hope you're getting the uh, gist of the question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think the, um, the key thing is that uh, illegal wildlife trade is a global issue and that if it's going to be addressed 
satisfactorily, we need global cooperation. We need countries working together. Uh, all too often we hear of a seizure of an illegal wildlife product in, in one country, and it's never followed up properly to find out where it originated, working with colleagues in enforcement agencies elsewhere. So that's one uh, critical area that needs to improve international cooperation. Uh, but also, uh, we've had quite a long uh, term uh, endeavour to try and raise uh, perception about the seriousness of wildlife trade, uh, wildlife crime, um, that it's not perceived, uh, often not perceived as being a serious crime. Whereas it is, it's a form of serious organised crime and it has all the trappings of, of serious organised crime. So uh, to address it, you need to start looking at financial flows, at trying to um, stop money laundering. So we've been talking to the banking sector uh, to get them involved from, on those sort of aspects. Um, so it's no one single uh, magic bullet that will address the issue. Uh, there's a whole variety of uh, um, actors and different sectors that need to be brought into play um, but um, you know perception that it's uh, uh, in the criminals mind that it's uh, a low risk high reward uh, activity has to be changed and that has to be changed by making um, those who are, are charged with uh, enforcing uh, the legislation um, aware that you know it, it really is a serious crime and that it should be taken seriously because of the potential impacts it has. Okay, uh, probably one of the last ones from Mahima. How have countries fared in adhering to sites? Does their data give a clear picture? Uh, sorry, how are they adhering to sites? Countries fared in adhering to sites. Does their data of these countries give a clear uh, picture? Um, well, CITES trade data, um, it's obviously it's only for species that are listed within the convention. Uh, so it only applies to those. So there's a lot of data on uh, other species that are traded that, that aren't captured. Uh, it's also notorious for um, many uh, discrepancies in it. So that country A will report exporting something in kilograms and country B will say we imported 6,000 of these things, you know, so there's a lot of, lot of issues like that, uh, that could be much improved if the, if the data reporting was improved. Uh, and, we, you know, organisations like um, the World Customs Organisation have got their harmonised uh, source codes, HS codes, um, that try and standardise some of these things. Uh, and if, if standardisation was available, in a lot of the data, it would, it would actually help enormously with, with picking up instances where uh, something untoward was happening, some illegal trade was happening, uh, because it, it, it's all in, the, all in the detail. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas. Uh, there is one interesting question again here from Caroline Chebet, uh, the standard Nakuru Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do hope you, um, we've not answered this. Uh, there have been several measures that have been put in place to curb IWT, uh, illegal trade, sorry, of pangolins. Among them, a particular one where Cameroon, Cameroon and Kenya adopted fingerprinting forensic technology to tackle pangolin trafficking. Has this had any impact? Uh, I do hope you have a take on this. Uh, well, forensics generally, uh, is very much coming into the sector now. So uh, Traffic is working closely with an organization called TRACE, uh, the Wildlife Forensics Network. Uh, and we actually have a, a program um, introducing wildlife forensics into three countries in Southern Africa, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. Um, so uh, basically training of forensic officers there in, in crime scene, um, how to uh, gather evidence, uh, secure the chain of custody so that it will be admissible in court. Um, so yes, there is an awful lot of work that is being done in this area and, and pangolins, uh, the, there is a, a database 
uh, now being generated of um, basically pangolin uh, profiles so that when, a, when, a, when seizures are made, they can hopefully be traced back to their origin based on um, what can be determined from their, their DNA uh, and stable isotopes and other, other techniques that are used. So this is another area. Uh, and, and, and again, it's uh, partly a question of, of wildlife crime not being seen as a, a serious crime, <laughs> that, that there hadn't, you know, there's been very little forensics applied to it up till now, but um, it, it, it is a growing area and one that I'm positive will, you know, produce results down the line. Uh, do, do you think it's changing now? Uh, do you think it is gonna change? Uh, because I think uh, you've said that uh, three uh, to four, of uh, new diseases, uh, you know, uh, viruses from uh, that are zoonotic. Uh, do you have cause for worry? Are we, are we, do you predict that it might get worse than COVID-19 in the future? Wow, well, uh, I think that's the risk. I mean, I think uh, the SARS outbreak for me was really the, the wake up call that we need to take um, the disease risk associated with uh, trade in animals uh, more seriously. Um, and we, we fail to heed that, uh, you know, in, globally we fail to heed that and now we're uh, experiencing the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, this has been so uh, widespread and uh, damaging, um, you know, killing thousands of people and uh, shattering the world's economy um, that I, you, would, you would anticipate that the, 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 the lessons uh, that we're you know, gathering from it will be learnt and taken on board. Um, but yes, uh, there is potentially a risk. I mean, COVID-19 does have a, a relatively a low death rate, but the next virus mightn't. Well, uh, Dr. Thomas, thank you very much. I think that's a good note uh, to bring this webinar to an end and uh, dear colleagues, uh, all the participants, I uh, thank you so very much uh, for your time. Uh, our time is up and you have many more questions that we've answered. Uh, we tried to, uh, Dr. Richard says he's open. Uh, we tried to answer these questions on email, uh, possibly. And uh, as we said in the beginning, uh, we have recorded this uh, webinar and it will be up in our, on our website uh, very soon. Uh, that is at journalism. Net. And if you're not a member already, uh, you can sign up, uh, which is free uh, to be getting more of these uh, reporter resources that uh, um, our journalism network you know, gathers. Thank you again, Dr. Thomas, uh, for having us, and we'll be talking to you. Uh, I hope you'll be open to questions uh, from our colleagues uh, in these times that I, I the very you know, curious to tell this story. Uh, so... Yes. Yeah. Please, please do email me if there's anything you'd like to, to question me about oh. and I'll do my best to respond. Uh, the email again is richard.thomas at traffic.org. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I will uh, forward you all the questions and see uh, if you are able to answer all of them. Uh, so everyone, uh, do have a good time wherever you are and stay safe, stay home. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.